I'm Robin Chandrapala, the founder of Armchair Criminal. This is part two of considering section 114 and 15 of Criminal Justice Act 2003 on exclusion rule and exceptions to the hearsay rule. We have looked at some of the provisions, how they were applied, and here we will continue with the same program. The first question that I will pose, the question is, what are the circumstances in which one can refresh the memory from an ESA statement? If the maker of the statement were to dictate and somebody else, somebody else writes it down, if that person who dictated the document were to adopt it, then that person is entitled to refresh his or her memory from that document. In other words, that person has adopted that document as his or her statement. The reason for that is this. If the person were not to adopt it, who knows? The person who wrote it down may have not recorded properly. So it is important for the person to consider it and adapt it. As simple as that. This is why I have always advocated those who attend police stations to represent clients they should take a proof, get the client to read it, sign it, if you wish, sign it as the witness, then there is a record of it. It's very, very important. People fail to take account of that. Because if the person is being challenged, either on the basis of a recent fabrication or won't refresh their memory, then that it is available. It is important to consider the cases of McLean, 1967, Jones and Matcliffe, and Meha and DPP. Next, what we will look at is what distinguishes a hearsay statement from a statement that can be adduced without breaching the rules. What distinguishes between a hearsay rule and a statement that is not caught by the act is the purpose. You look to the purpose. That is why I earlier mentioned to challenge an allegation of recent fabrication. You look at section 115 and that basically gives you the leeway how to adduce it. The examples of this rule can be seen when one looks at recent fabrications. The prosecution tells, puts to the plant, you recently invented this defense. No, 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 no. I said this right at the beginning at the police station. So it rebuts the reason to fabrication. 
the next one is when one looks at the actors reels if you are looking at an offense of public code using abusive language or where there has been false representation to get money from a bank for a fraud case or state benefits whatever you need the previous statement so that that comes out as part and parcel of the actors rears of the offense because the purpose there is not to prove the truth of its contents it is to show that the statement was made how can you prove a false representation if you cannot adduce the representation that was made it's a nonsense second next is lies and giving false accounts if your client were to give a comment interview and he comes up with utter load of rubbish in the interview and during the trial the prosecution can adduce evidence to discredit him again those lies false accounts can come in look at the case of Manjin and that is important this was a case where the suspect gave false alibi and he was shut down during the trial equally there will be cases where you will adduce the previous statement to show the state of the mind of the person who heard it for example when you look at cases of duress or for that matter section 45 modern slavery act defense what happens is the person is threatened he or she is coerced then they can go on to do whatever they are being asked to do sell drugs or whatever so in those situations you need to bring in the previous statement made out of court which technically is a hearsay but here the purpose is to show how the recipient perceived it what is the state of the mind of the person this on this point i would recommend that you look at dpp and subramanian i believe this is a case that if i recall correctly is from malaysia that will demonstrate what is the situation in those situations therefore when you ask the question if the statement is adduced to prove any matter stated in that statement then would i be caught by the rules the answer is if the purpose is not to prove the truth of its contents then the statement is not caught by the hearsay rules i just gave you a couple of authorities and also legislation allows abe interview to be adduced or direct evidence finally this this the gang culture can be proved with out of court statements because there could be a, a insignias gestures whole raft of 
communication, not necessarily verbally, including gestures. Therefore, those things will be important. And they will be exception to the hearsay rule. Next, what is the effect and the meaning of a statement not made in the proceedings? The concept is applicable to all statements except those made by a statement when giving evidence orally in court. This is a complete ban. We will be covering this point when we look at self-serving statements and corroboration, self-corroboration. In essence, self-corroboration or self-serving statements, sometimes they are also referred to as oath serving statements is generated to bolster up the witnesses evidence in court. If the exclusion rule affects all statements as a complete ban, what does it mean? The statement reads a statement not made in oral evidence in the proceedings. So what it does not say is a statement made by a person who does not give oral evidence in the proceedings. Which means that even a retrial can exclude evidence of a previous original trial. Because the proceedings means these proceedings, which we have looked at. It is important to note the reason for that. You can have a retrial. And if that witness does not come and give evidence in court for the new trial, i.e. the retrial, and if the prosecution, say for instance their witness who is not in court, is adducing evidence from the retrial, what is denied to the court is judging the demeanor of the witness, which is body language is very important, which I have mentioned earlier. And there is no way to cross-examine any further. However, however, there are ways of adducing evidence from a previous hearing that can be done. That is a separate topic itself for but it can be done. So what is the effect of that? The effect of an exclusion rule not only affects the statement made by the person who does not come to court, but the rule against the narrative what is also described as self-serving statements or self-corroborating or oath-serving statements. They are one and the same. However, under certain circumstances, it may be possible to adduce statements made out of court, such as for the purposes of memory refresher. Again, I look, mentioned that about the police station. But that is not the only person, the defendant is not the only person who could refresh if they want to. But very often the police officers do. And other witnesses. 
Look at section 120. And uh, section 119 equally. However, inconsistent statements are not regarded within this definition because they are being adduced to literally the, the inconsistencies. That is why I said look at section 119 and 120. Now for a moment let's stop and discuss what is self-serving or self-corroborating, oath-serving, however you want to describe a statement out of court, what it is. Very often, witnesses, what they do is, before they come to court, they will discuss the case with several people. A, B, C, and D, and E, F, the list goes on. And they give their version of events. Then what they like to do is, come to court and tell in their evidence, oh, I told this person, that person, this person, that person, 100 people. So therefore it must be true. No, it doesn't. Because an out-of-court statement of that nature is literally what it means. You are trying to corroborate yourself. You are trying to self, it's a self-serving statement. Just because a witness repeats it hundred times, it doesn't become any more truthful than not telling anyone else. If it is a lie, it will be repeated only hundred times by saying it. That is the purpose. However, if it is introduced, to rebut a recent fabrication, like I said about the police station, then that's a different ballgame. And here I would ask you to look at, as I mentioned earlier, section 120 and 119. Next question to ask, why a self-serving statement, i.e. the narrative, is caught in this section when the witness is giving evidence in court. That is because section 114 says, as evidence of any matter stated in it which I just explained to you, the whole purpose of a narrative, self-serving statement, self-corroborating, is for one purpose and one purpose only, to work as an oath-serving statement. That is why it is called an oath-serving. The whole purpose is, repeat it elsewhere, elsewhere, come back and come to the court and say it. Oh, I said that. So it must be right. No, it doesn't. Stop the person in their tracks. And for that purpose and that purpose alone, the concept of the word purpose in the section is crucial. That is where you define what is a hearsay statement that should be disallowed. It is an out of court statement, but it should be allowed in evidence. That's the way to do it. Next, let's look at where does the word statement Come in. Look at section 114. 
for a moment. It says, in any criminal proceedings, a statement. It can't be more clearer than that. So it refers to a statement. Remember, there's a fantastic definition of a statement, which we are now going to look at when we look at the question. Is there a definition of the word statement and where is it? For that, you look at section 115. In particular, subsection 2 and 3. What is the definition of the word statement? Section 115, subsection 2. A statement is any, emphasis any. This is where I discussed gestures. Uh, it could be a nod, thumbs up, anything representation of any fact or opinion made by a person which we will look at person is important by whatever means and includes a representation made in sketch photo fit or other pictorial form that is subsection 2 then subsection 3 a matter stated to which this chapter applies if and only if the purpose, which we looked at very carefully on several locations, or one of the purposes of the person making the statement appears to the court to have been A, cause another to believe the matter, or to cause another to act or a machine to operate on the basis of that matter is as stated. In other words, the court will look at what was the purpose. Was it made in order for someone to act? Or a machine to operate that is important next look at what are the nuts and bolts of section 114 and 115 of the criminal justice act the list can go on for quite a few parts but in my opinion first you look at who made it? Is it a person? It's important. Is it representation? Fact of opinion? Was it made? For what purpose? Was it to make a person believe? Or to cause another to act or for a machine to operate? These things are crucial. We look, we discuss the issue of person. Why? That will co come when you look at why it is not. Okay? It sounds, uh, uh, it is in fact that easy to put it in those terms. What is the effect of a person? making a statement. The exclusion rules has no application to statements made by machines that automatically produce an observation such as a field gauge, a bromometer, a compass, a thermometer, ARNP, automatic registration of number plates. Telephone locks. You get a telephone bill. Nobody puts in the information. It automatically generates it. Then artificial intelligence. Why 
is that a distinction between a statement made by a person and a statement generated automatically important automatically by a machine if you do watch aircraft crash investigations like I do you will understand why believe you me it is said that most aircraft crashes take place because of human error same thing here there is a greater probability of remaking us an error than an automatic machine generated information Brahmapita gives the reading of the weather and everything else they tend to be correct computers doing a scientific calculation and giving the information you can put your bottom dollar that it is likely to be correct people will not be putting humans into a rocket if certain things cannot happen you'll be surprised as much as we are very intelligent we make fundamental mistakes that is why there's a distinction between the two the next is how about security recording CCTVs tape recordings how do they work well that's quite easy CCTV recordings are adduced as real evidence what it means is this let's take for example you are in your office looking at your security camera screen you see what's happening outside of your office as if you are there and you can see it at a later time so it is as good as you being there that is why it is regarded as real evidence have a look at the authority of Dodson and Taylor and Chief Constable of Cheshire it doesn't mean that you are obliged every time to accept and allow the evidence to go in it may very well be that once it is real evidence there are breaches of procedure irregularities I'm talking about like breaches of pace reaper if there are breaches of your regulatory powers investigation act or other provisions then it may be possible for you to make an application to exclude the evidence under section 78 provided it is coming from the prosecution look at the computers how about computer printouts the printouts from computers that are used for storage of information or where the computer generates a calculation based on the information provided by a human the computer printouts that are produced from a computer where the information is produced is working no more than as a storage facility therefore is caught by the legislation consequently that is why very often we challenge 
list of previous convictions produced from the PNC, that is Police National Computer. The logic behind this is quite simple. The prosecution is adducing a list of previous convictions. Why are they producing it? The purpose is to show the person has these convictions recorded against him. So the purpose is clear to prove that person got convictions. The problem is the list of convictions recorded in the computer was not done by the officer in this case. It would have been done by someone else. Therefore, there is room for error. And if you go to court on a regular basis, you would realize we do challenge the accuracy of previous convictions. And very often, there are discrepancies. However, where a computer calculates something based on information that is provided by someone, such as a toxicology report, is caught by the same provisions. See the case of Wood. That is because the report is based on the information which was put into the machine. Just like with the PNC. That is why I highlighted those two. So look at the authorities of Contra Justice's Exparte Blood and Crown and Wood. Next, let's look at what is the reason for the decision in Contra Justice's Exparte Blood and Wood. In fact, I just covered it. Uh, this is because of human intervention. Look at section 129, Criminal Justice Act 2003, which says, where a representation of any fact is made otherwise than by a person, but depends on the accuracy on information supplied directly or indirectly by a person, the representation is not admissible in criminal proceedings as evidence of the fact unless it is proved that the information was correct. There you are. Subsection 1 does not affect the operation of the presumption that a mechanical device has been properly set or calibrated. We looked at the issue of toxicology report. That all depends on what the information is put there and what you get. Okay. Compare that with a drink drive case. Yes, one can challenge the land intoximeter or whatever the machine that they use these days to calculate breath test. It is not impossible. It, it has been done. It, it, it can be done. But there's a presumption that the machine was properly set and calibrated. So when you do challenge a drink drive case, what you are doing is you are challenging that presumption. The presumption is in favor of it being correct. So the burden is on you to prove that it is wrong. That's an error. Okay. What it says is that toxicology reports is as good as what you put in there. But 
the, the accuracy, because it says in subsection B, depends on it for accuracy on information supplied by a person. Representation is not admissible in criminal proceedings as evidence of fact unless it is proved that the information was correct. That is where, when experts are relying on calculations to say this is the result, they have to prove what they input by way of data is correct. But otherwise, the machine is deemed to be correct. Let's see if we can now reconcile. How can we reconcile the two dictums in Wood and the ex parte Ballard? As I have been going on for a little while now, it is the scientific information. If there is human intervention, then it is caught within the hearsay rules. The courts regard that computer used to calculate scientific information fed into the computer has to be correct. That's they, they have to prove that it is correct. The rest, as far as the machine is concerned, there's a presumption that it is working properly. That is why very often experts are required to attend court to explain sometimes the methodology, what information they used, how they did that. Let's look at how about sniffer dogs. Sniffer dogs, needless to be said, that's a handler, usually a police officer, trained police officer. It is the officer's evidence that will be relied in court. But that officer is basing the statement based on the information that he understood from the sniffer dog. This is a separate topic itself, itself which is very interesting. And there's a special procedure that one has to go through to adduce evidence from sniffer dogs, which I will look at it on another uh, topic. The leading authority is, if you are interested, is Crown and Peterson and Holloway. Next, what is meant by the statement must be representation of fact or opinion. Fact or opinion. The purpose of cause another to, person to believe or to act or a machine to operate. The purpose should be the representation that was made for the purposes of another person to believe or to act for a machine to operate. That is why I used the example right at the beginning of this program about the fraud delegation, going to the bank and making representation. Next, if the statement is relevant to an issue in later criminal proceedings, would it still be hearsay? Again, I covered that right at the beginning with regard to the fraud case and the public code offense. When I talked about uh, public order offences, bad language being adduced. Otherwise, you can't prove the offence or threats to kill. Equally, modern slavery case 
and defense of duress. If next is if the representation is facto opinion, does it matter how it was made? The short answer is no. Look at section 115. What it says is whatever means, whatever means, and it includes a representation made in sketch, photo fit, or any other pictorial form. There you are. The authority, this is quite old now, uh, Crown and Chandrasekhar. Here, the victim was unable to speak, if I recall the facts correctly. The throat was slit. Therefore, made gestures implicating the accused that was allowed to be admitted. In these situations, section 120 could be very helpful. Look for the purpose in section 115 subsection 3 of the person making the statement have been, goes on to believe, cause another to act or machine to operate. What does it mean? This means that the person who's making the statement must intend another to rely or to act, a machine to operate. In a way, there's a, one would argue there's an uh, implied assertion, but implied assertions are now being taken out of the equation altogether by this act. If the statement was not made in that manner, then the restrictions do not apply. We will look at the case of Singh and few other cases. The, some of these cases, what they will clearly will demonstrate, or at least I hope they will demonstrate, according to my understanding, is that you look to the purpose and with that it should come clear if the statement is adduced to show the truth of its contents then that statement is caught by the exclusion rule but if it is Adduce for a different purpose. In other words, some other purpose. Then the hearsay rules do not apply. We have a list of cases. Singh, Leonard. It is clear is bulk of these cases come from drug offences. Here the defendant was charged and convicted of conspiracy and it was an allegation of kidnap. The conviction took place based on the text messages from the memory of the phone and other people. The Crown was able to show a large amount of text and he was convicted he appealed and it was argued that that should not have been the case because there's an implied assertion that he was part of a gap the Court of Appeal rejected that. The Court of Appeal rejected that argument and the Court of Appeal said, in effect, section 118, not merely, not merely 
abolished the common law exception to the hearsay rule, but common law exclusion rules themselves. The Court of Appeal went on to say, what was said by the caller in Kiele would now be admissible as direct evidence of the fact that there was a ready market for the supply of drugs from the premises, from which could be inferred an intention by the occupier to supply drugs. The view of the majority of the Kiele in relation to hearsay has now been got rid of. Now, that is why I mentioned it earlier. That, in fact, I think I said that at the first part of this program, that the descending judgment is now regarded as the good law. In the case of Leonard, the defendant stood trial on drug offences. There were text messages on the defendant's phone which commented on the quality of the drugs previously supplied. The Crown sought to adduce those text messages to prove A. the quality of the drugs and B. that the defendant was a drug dealer. Now can you imagine in the light of Kiyoli and Zing what this is? The court held that if those things are correct, then evidence is hearsay. But would it make any difference if the crown was to show the relationship between the parties without trying to prove the quality of the drugs that was previously supplied and the defendant himself. Then there's the case of twist which is very very important. To, in, in the case of twist it was made abundantly clear the word assertion has no place in modern jurisprudence with regards to hearsay. Equally the matter stated means a fact but opinion can also be given I would really recommend that you would read twist the case of testimony is there I'm not going to go all, all this because there's a lot of cases and it could, it could take a quite a considerable amount of time next what I'm going to look at is if a document is created for personal use, not intended to be used by another, sorry, not intended to be seen by another, does it constitute to be hearsay? Therefore, do exclusion rules apply? The short answer is no. Because things like private diaries are not to be in, not made to be seen by others. No one was trying to convince another person to do something or a machine to operate. So there was no intention. There was no purpose other than for personal. So that is important to note. Finally, let's conclude this part of the program. What is my conclusion, sum total? You can see that all hearsay statements are subject to the exclusion rule. The party seeking to rely on the material must make an application to adduce the, spe adduce the statement under a specific exception. However, hearsay evidence can be adduced by agreement and there is no definition of an agreement that is quite crucial if hearsay evidence 
is admitted inadvertently or for that matter even by agreement there is no provision to reel back anything that goes in once the hearsay evidence goes in it's there the criminal justice act does not give room for it to be real back so you got to be careful right at the outset do i want this in or not this is a particular problem where hearsay statements are admitted by agreement and the trial judge may very well be unaware why it is going in because the trial judge may not be told and the different parties may have different agendas which are in conflict so can you imagine the dichotomy the dilemma the learned judge will be placed with during the summing up there could be two different reasons which do not sit comfortably with one another and it may very well be the learned judge has no option but to discharge the entire jury as a result of the parties not communicating with each other in sincerity what i would suggest if you are going to adduce hearsay evidence by agreement speak to your opponent understand each other as to why you want these things otherwise it could be a bigger mess than anything else that is the end of this part of the program with regard to uh look, considering section 114 and 15 of the criminal justice act 2003 now we are going to move on to looking at specific provisions where you can adduce hearsay evidence like by agreement unavailable witnesses documentary evidence common law exceptions including res gestae confessions and the like they are yet to come i hope this has been useful and that you have enjoyed thank you for your valuable time look forward to seeing you again take care and god bless